Yes, and, and thank you for staying up this late or, or to, for this plenary. We'd like to thank fit for me for sponsoring this segment here, for this plenary. Um, and actually with me is a co-chair, uh, Dr. Wai Yang, who doesn't need an introduction. He just came from the last session. Um, but anyway, he's the president-elect of the Young Ipso, um, and also uh, a bariatric surgery uh, at the first affiliated hospital of Jinan University, Guangzhou in China. Um, actually, we all know that life begins truly after the surgery, and if not for the hard work of our dedicated dietitians, uh, we really can't uh, gain a lot of successes with our patients, especially with nutritional deficiencies. Um, so actually, with us today, we have uh, Mariam Lakdawala, who will give us the first presentation on the importance of nutritional supplementation after bariatric surgery. Mariam um, is a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes educator from Mumbai, India. And she currently works uh, with Dr. Aparna Govil at the Global Hospital uh, at, uh, at Mumbai uh, in India. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass the time over to Miriam there. Um, may, I uh, may I introduce uh, the second speaker? Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes. yes <laughs> <right>. <laughs> but the video is playing. Oh, okay. Uh, please allow me to introduce the, our second speaker, uh, Fiona uh, Summer from uh, Australia. Fiona has been uh, an accredited practicing dietitian for uh, 23 years, starting her career in Austin Health, working in a wide range of clinical areas, and also as a uh, deputy uh, manager of the nutrition department for 15 years. Fiona has worked in uh, both public and private service, specializing in weight management, and has been part of the team at uh, Darwin uh, Weight Loss Surgery for in the last uh, 16 years. And so uh, Fiona is going to share the topic, is there ever too much uh, vitamin? And I also have to thank again our sponsor, Fit for Me, again for sponsoring this session yeah so uh let's welcome our speakers Hello everyone, my name is Mariam Lakravala. I'm a registered dietitian and a bariatric nutritionist from India. Uh, before starting the presentation, I would like to thank IFSO and FIT for me for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present on the topic of the importance of nutritional supplementation post bariatric surgery. So I will be quickly talking about the deficiencies that are commonly seen um, in people suffering from obesity, what basically bariatric surgery, how it affects the uh, nutritional status, what are certain commonly seen um, nutritional deficiencies, how do we routinely sub uh, follow a supplementation protocol, management of the nutritional deficiencies. So as we all know, obesity is a state of malnutrition and the nutritional rate, the incidence of nutritional deficiencies is higher in people suffering from obesity due to excessive consumption of processed and packaged food, empty calorie food, uh, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, obesity is a state of chronic inflammation um, as the excess of the adipose tissue secretes pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this chronic state of inflammation also leads to an increase in the release, uh, increased release of hepcidin in liver and fatty tissues, which interferes with the iron absorption. Also, there is altered metabolism of certain nutrients seen, prolonged use of certain medications and food preferences, which also has an impact. So like we see, major uh, nutrients get absorbed in the first part of the intestine, that is the duodenum and the proximal jejunum. And in the latter part of the small intestine, it is basically the absorption of the digested nutrients and the uh, digestion of fat-soluble vitamins. So though the micronutrient requirement is very less, uh, the deficiency can actually lead to severe consequences. So what happens after bariatric surgery is that uh, the restrictive procedures um, basically causes a decrease in the intake, decreases the gastric acid, which is required for the breakdown of proteins um, and for the conversion of the ferric to the active form, that is ferrous form. Also, the accelerated gastric emptying uh, leads to some degree of malabsorption in the beginning. Post the gastric bypasses, um, 
in addition to restriction there is also malabsorption the malabsorption varies depending on the biliopancreatic limb length uh, so definitely bigger the limb length uh, more will be the nutritional deficiencies um, uh, so the deficiencies of fat soluble vitamins and uh, trace elements is generally seen after extremely malabsorptive procedures so the macronutrient deficiency that is commonly seen is that of protein and uh, it leads to decreased muscle mass hair loss anemia hypoalbuminemia uh, protein supplementation uh, that is 100% whey hydrolyzed along with eucin is considered uh, and forms at least 30 to 50% of the protein requirements in case of low levels of albumin between 2.5 and 3.5 definitely the protein requirement the protein supplements are increased but if the levels are very low that is less than 2.5 then enteral parenteral nutrition can also be considered especially when the intake is very low so this is just a chart uh, showing different studies that are done in different population and uh, what is seen is that the prevalence of deficiency is higher post gastric uh, uh, gastric bypass compared to the sleeve gastrectomy coming to the micronutrient uh, deficiency so iron deficiency is seen in almost more than 30% of the patients post bariatric surgery after 5 years uh, common symptoms include fatigue breathlessness uh, hair loss dizziness bone shape or nails with vertical ridges so generally oral supplements of uh, uh, dosage of 38 to 60 mg is what we uh, prescribe to the patients preferably ferrous form or uh, fumarate glycemate form along with vitamin c uh, definitely these iron supplements should not be taken along with calcium as it interferes with the absorption of each other also we need to check for overdose especially in cases of thalassemia and in case of deficiency iv iron um, administration it can be done and this can be followed with a uh, oral um, iron uh, supplementation as a maintenance dose vitamin b12 deficiency is seen in 19 to 35% of the patients uh, post bariatric surgery after 5 years mainly after bypasses it leads to uh, clinical manifestations like tingling in hands and leg muscle weakness muscle pain megaloblastic anemia memory loss shortness of breath fatigue Uh, so routinely um, we do uh, give the vitamin b12 supplement separately as it is not really there in a good concentration in the generic multivitamins so we do uh, give them intramuscular or in the sublingual or tablet form in case of deficiency we do give them uh, intramuscular shots which are then followed by a maintenance dose folic acid deficiency is seen in 9 to 39% of the patients and uh, it is mainly seen either due to reduced intake or due to uh, vitamin b12 deficiency because it is required for the conversion of the inactive form of folate to its active form common uh, symptoms include megaloblastic anemia fatigue shortness of breath difficulty in concentration uh, folic acid again is not really separ uh, separately supplemented until unless we see a deficiency and around 1 mg can be given per day uh, however higher doses should not be given as it could mask the vitamin b12 deficiency bone uh, turnover also increases after uh, bariatric surgery and there could be uh, a bone loss of around 10% which is seen and uh, the bone loss is higher post uh, extremely malabsorptive surgeries and this increases the risk of fractures and uh, which is around 58% after 15 years as compared to the non surgical uh, non surgical weight loss which is mainly due to the calcium and vitamin d deficiencies so calcium leads to muscle cramping increases susceptibility to fractures 1000 mg is what we uh, prescribe our patients who undergo on sleeve and rygb on a daily basis but in divided doses uh, in case of oagb and extremely malabsorptive surgeries the the supplementation can go up to 1500 to 2000 mg per day uh, vitamin d is not given separately as it is a part of the calcium supplement Uh, but in case of deficiency intramuscular injections can be given and that can be followed with a maintenance dose uh, vitamin b1 is also not given separately um, the deficiency is generally seen in case of persistent vomiting or dehydration but it is very important to give a prophylactic uh, dose of vitamin b if if you feel and if you suspect a deficiency because the deficiency of b1 can actually lead to irreversible neurological damage so giving an iv shot is a good option as it is not going to lead to any toxicity 
fat soluble vitamins again are not really um, the deficiency of these nutrients are not is not really seen after restrictive uh, surgeries or even after rygb but yes if there is an extremely malabsorptive surgery then the deficiencies could be seen generally it is a part of the multivitamin so it's not given separately until and unless there is deficiency that has been seen trace elements uh, are also commonly uh, the deficiency of these uh, nutrients is seen post the extremely malabsorptive surgeries uh, some of the clinical manifestations that can be uh, captured are uh, zinc could show taste changes unexplained anemia copper could show unexplained anemia selenium could lead to uh, deficiency could lead to chronic diarrhea metabolic bone disease unexplained anemia and magnesium could uh, uh, lead deficiency could lead to hypocalcemia now zinc and copper it is very important to manage a ratio uh, when it comes to zinc and copper because if if the ratio is not managed it could lead to deficiency of the other uh, due to competitive absorption so for every 8 to 15 mg of zinc 1 mg of copper should be supplemented so the protocol that is followed generally after surgery is that post the restrictive surgeries uh, generally for the first 6 months to 1 year uh, multivitamin calcium and iron supplements should be given uh in case of the malabsorptive surgeries uh, or the gastric bypasses supplementation of multivitamin calcium and iron should be lifelong and can be uh, uh, decreased or increased depending on the lab investigations that are done at regular follow ups uh, b12 and d is supplemented based on the investigations and definitely the emphasis should be on the composition that is best absorbed so here in india we generally give the generic uh, supplements more because of the affordability so making sure that the composition is uh, the one which gets absorbed and is the most suitable should be the main emphasis compliance is one big problem a recent study has shown that more than 50% of the patients were not able to comply and take the supplements regularly mainly and some of the common reasons cited were difficulty in remembering too many tablets to take side effects uh, non prescribing from the gp bad taste don't feel the need to take it the patients also gave some suggestions in order to improve the compliance uh, that is reducing the number of tablets uh, educating the patient giving them more information uh, from especially from the healthcare providers uh, reducing the cost so definitely by focusing on these parameters we can improve the compliance so i would like to conclude by saying that the deficiencies of uh, most of these uh, fat soluble vitamins and micronutrients are more pronounced after the extremely malabsorptive surgeries uh, because definitely there is limited exposure of the food to the uh, absorption site and the biliopancreatic secretions and it is very important to do the nutritional screening at regular intervals to follow up with the patients with regular uh, at regular intervals so as to ensure that the patient is compliant is taking the supplements regularly um, and this will help to prevent the nutritional deficiencies uh, regular screening will also i help to identify if there are any deficiencies and to correct it timely so patient education is should be like a continuous process it starts right from the beginning before the surgery and it should be continued life long even after surgery these are my references thank you if there are any questions i would be happy to answer them hello i'm fiona samet and i would like to thank the iso asia pacific committee for inviting me to participate in today's meeting as well as fit for me for sponsorship of today's session and i'm delighted to raise the question with you today of vitamins is there ever too much we put a lot of focus on trying to ensure that our patients take adequate micronutrient supplements to prevent the deficiencies that can be so common after bariatric surgery as Mariam has also discussed earlier is it possible however that taking too much of some nutrients could potentially cause harm and the short answer is yes while we hope that patients will follow our recommendations we need to be aware of the balance of what is provided in the supplement formulas we recommend while poor compliance is often an issue It is also possible and a reality that patients will take additional supplements not necessarily recommended by us and they could therefore be taking more than the recommended and safe amounts of some nutrients. The challenge for us is to get the balance right. It's not always an easy task. On the following two slides, I've summarized for you the nutrients that have upper limits specified by Australian, US and New Zealand guidelines. Uh, the figures quoted here are for adults aged 19 years and above. I've also listed the possible consequences of excess 
I won't have time to elaborate on this information today much further, but I do believe that you'll have access to my slides and I have included a number of key references on my final slides for you to seek further information if you wish. I have bolded the nutrients that I feel may be of particular importance to be aware of in bariatrics. There are many published case reports of adverse events, of excessive vitamin A, vitamin B6, vitamin D, as well as documented cases of negative interactions with excessive folic acid. We need to consider not only the impact of the physical symptoms of excess on our patients, but also that excessive amounts of some nutrients can impact on the absorption of other nutrients. And there's also potential for interference in some diagnostic tests, leading to falsely abnormal readings. When it comes to minerals, one of the most important things to consider is the impact of the nutrient-nutrient interactions. So here the balance provided in multivitamins or combinations of supplements, uh, it's important to consider the mineral balance. Zinc and copper, for example, should be matched to the ratio listed in the table um, of one milligram of copper to every eight to 15 milligrams of zinc. Doses of greater than 25 milligrams of elemental iron a day, uh, which is commonly required in bariatrics, can inhibit zinc absorption. So adequacy of zinc in formulations needs to be considered. And calcium, as we know, can affect um, other mineral absorption, such as zinc and iron. When considering the factors that can lead to the risk of excess, it's, uh, as you would be aware, the majority of bariatric guidelines uh, universally recommend multivitamin supplementation daily and for long-term for most bariatric procedures. And sub-guidelines simply recommend two adult multivitamins. As clinicians, clinicians, it's important for us to be aware specifically of what exactly is in those multivitamins. As you'll be aware, many general multivitamins do not contain sufficient amounts of some nutrients to prevent common deficiencies in bariatrics, namely iron and B12. Um, and certainly in Australia, there are hundreds and hundreds of these general multivitamin formulations, but most are vastly different in their contents. Many of them actually contain some nutrients, greater than 500% of the recommended daily amounts and greater than the safe upper limits for some nutrients. Although we know that there can be a high incidence of poor compliance in our patient group, there is also a culture of health seeking and wellness that may be prevalent in our clients. And the tendency to Dr. Google and perhaps be swayed by information shared on social media and presented on other online sources can lead to clients taking additional or alternatives to what we would ideally recommend. We need to consider the additive effect of all supplements taken. There's also a risk that when recommendations of higher doses for treatment of deficiency, which are actually often required for bariatrics, if these are not monitored and readjusted when levels normalise, that can put us at risk of unnecessary excessive intake to occur. I just wanted to highlight one particular area that has become of high interest in the bariatric community in Australia, but also internationally. Vitamin B6 is an exception to the assumption that all water-soluble vitamins will be excreted if taken in excessive amounts. And it's known that excessive intake of vitamin B6 uh, can be potentially toxic and a cause of peripheral neuropathy symptoms. And certainly in studies of bariatric populations, there have been found to be high vitamin B6 levels in up to 50% of patients. In Australia, there are numerous supplements and drinks that can contain high doses or contribute to cumulative effects of vitamin B6. And recently, this issue has prompted a review by our regulatory bodies, um, as it's actually been found that very high vitamin B6 levels can actually occur at much lower doses than our current upper limit of 50 milligrams a day. While it's known that there will be inter-individual differences in the response to high-dose vitamin B6, the potential for harm exists, and this is a risk we need to control for. So if you find this happening in your client groups, it's advisable to ask lots of questions, find out exactly what people are taking, and recommend ceasing all vitamin B6 intake. Retesting after two to three weeks, this time frame has been found to be sufficient to significantly reduce levels and recommencing required supplements, which of course will be needed. Um, however, amounts of vitamin B6 required in supplementation in bariatrics has been shown one to 1 1.5 milligrams a day is, is sufficient to prevent deficiencies. So only very small amounts are needed. And consider the form of the vitamin, the 
the hydrochloride form of vitamin B6 is found to be more toxic than the phosphate form, which can be found in some supplements, which is a bonus. So as in summary, as clinicians, uh, we really have an important role in the education of our patients, not only on the risks and consequences of deficiency, but also the potential harm of excess. We can really be helping them to understand the importance of the balance. We're lucky in Australia to have access now um, to a number of bariatric specialised formulas, and these formulas can really take the hard work out of it for us. Um, the balance that's required for our bariatric community um, has been considered and we've got a greater confidence that those formulas may help us to not only avoid deficiency, but also more likely to avoid excess problems as well. We need to ask questions about everything our patients are taking. We need to keep in mind the cumulative effect of all things consumed. And when monitoring pathology, our blood results, we're looking for lows, but let's also be conscious of um, looking for the highs and taking corrective action when required. When treating deficiency, that importance of monitoring and readjustment must also be considered to avoid prolonged unnecessary high doses. So that's it from me today. I thank you very much for your attention. I have included a number of references on my final slides and I look forward to your questions and further discussion to follow. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much uh, for our two speakers, uh, Miriam and Fiona, and for very comprehensive uh, information for us. So uh, are there any questions from the floor? Uh, if no, um, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to start uh, my first question. And, and are there any tips from you uh, to enhance uh, patient's compliance uh, to lifelong uh, nutritional supplementation because as in many centers the patient just quit uh, nutritional supplementation uh, one year after the operation even uh, shorter for some six months after the operation they just quit i don't need to take any uh, vitamins uh, any proteins uh, do you have any tips um, for us Because this is the same concern that we face at uh, we face in our practice as well, where patients don't really come up for a few years for a, for a follow up. So I think the tip would be to maybe uh, maintain the data and to call them at regular intervals, maybe uh, uh, you know put it on the calendar to sort of have reminders. That is what we do at our end. We uh, mark it on the calendar at regular intervals, and then we call them. We do a, a round of uh, emailers for them, like reminder emailers, and then we call them to just get an idea if they are, you know, what is their weight uh, progress, weight loss progress, uh, are they taking any supplements, and, uh, you know, if they are facing any difficulties. So that is one thing. It has to be a very close follow up. So I think so. Question for uh, follow up the question, Fiona, you mentioned that in Australia you have uh, something that is kind of tailored for patients after bariatric surgery. I think you mentioned the fit for purpose. So do you think that has enhanced the compliance because there's supposedly fewer tablets then? Yes, we certainly we certainly have a lot of patients that will um, feel the need to opt for a general multivitamin because they, there is that assumption that it's going to be a cheaper option for them. Um, but often patients will, over time, realise that without having the right levels of iron, B12, they're sort of constantly falling into iron deficiency and declining B12 levels. Um, and often they're quite pleased to find that there's an option for them that can cover their bases a lot better um, and prevent the additive effect of all these separate supplements. Um, makes it just much simpler for the patients. Um, and look, when, when we actually, I often will sit down with my clients and say to them, well, look, here's the general multivitamin plus all the other things that you might need to take to prevent the deficiencies. Um, we compare that in the pricing to the cost of the bariatric supplement and there's often very, very minor difference um, and patients go for the more simple option, really helps with compliance, definitely. That's good. I think also another question is, you know, after, with COVID-19 and also in your countries, um, patients come from very far away. 
Uh, have you found any methods like calling them or telehealth improving uh, the touch points and the compliance in your practices, both speakers? Uh, yeah, look, I think um, the, the telehealth has opened up a lot of new avenues for us, um, particularly for the patients that come from long distances. Uh, also, the telehealth has been really helpful for helping people fit it into their lifestyle with work commitments and family commitments, etc. So I think that's been really good for um, patients coming to their appointments. Um, I don't know that it's helped with uh, multivitamin compliance, but <laughs> um, we certainly also have uh, used, I suppose, we've utilised more forms of um, providing people with um, videos and uh, other sort of electronic information to help enhance their education for um, the nutritional information that we provide as well. Super. And Miriam, any um, thoughts from your side? Uh, so yes, uh, because of COVID, we also have been doing a lot of video consultations, um, which has actually improved uh, the number of uh, follow-ups because um, as Fiona said, that if they have any personal commitments, it's still a little doable to come on a video consult and uh, that also helps us to sort of reinforce that uh, you need to take your supplements, you need to exercise, you need to follow a good diet. So that reinforcement is a, uh, I mean, it's a better thing that is done with the help of the teleconsult and video consult. Definitely helps. All right, that's good. Um, more, any questions from you? Mm, yeah, uh, no, I'm good. And you look, still look fit uh, even during the pandemic. We all gain in weight. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to, yeah, fit the image of healthy living with obesity. Okay, then with that, I'll, I'll close the session. Um, thank you, our speakers. Uh, thank you, Wa, and uh, our Fit For Me um, a, a, a sponsor. I think in closing, I think it, just with obesity management has been mentioned, we can bring our patient to the water. We can't make them drink. I think it's beyond uh, tablets and beyond all this knowledge. I think a lot of patient factors, I think we need to research a lot more in Asia. Uh, what are the factors that make them not adhere to the exercise that we talked about earlier session and to all these supplements? I think it goes beyond um, just a very simple medical nagging and all that. So I hope uh, we can hear more next year, uh, more, more findings, yeah? So with that, uh, I'd like to close the session.